Hello, Tonsei. Good afternoon and welcome to APTN In Focus. I'm Daryl Stranger. It's been over a month since tragic events on the James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan took the nation and some of the world really by storm. The mass stabbing left 11 people dead and many injured, and it had leaders leadership calling for more First Nations police forces in communities across the country. This week, the Fed's Provincial Ministers of Public Safety and Prince Albert Grand Council signed a letter of intent to explore new ways of offering policing on First Nations. And today, we are putting Indigenous policing in focus. And as always, we want you to join in on our conversation. You can email infocus at aptn.ca and you can also send us a tweet at aptninfocus. Now, before I introduce you to our guests, let's set the scene a little bit. Here's a look at leadership reaction following the James Smith incident. These acts of violence have to stop, and they have to stop now. We ask that we have our own tribal policing. We're increasing our Indigenous recruitment so that we can provide that structure, so that we can work together for a self-governed police service. The reason why that we are pushing uh, tribal policing is, is things like this shouldn't happen to any community. The benefits of this would be trust, love. We can go gather, not scared out of our wits. It's a benefit for this community, other communities. So it's not just us. It's a surrounding area in Turtle Island. Now representing over 70 First Nations in Saskatchewan, including James Smith, is the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations. FSN, FSIN, excuse me, Vice Chief Heather Bear joins us now. Heather, hello. Thank you for taking a few minutes out of your day to speak with us today. So we'll just start off, we're talking about Indigenous policing here on uh, this episode of In Focus. Um, indigenous policing was a major topic following the uh, tragedy in James Smith Cree Nation last month. Um, how do you think Indigenous policing on, uh, in the community, excuse me, could have maybe helped that situation? Well, uh, well, first of all, it's, uh, it's been a, a tough uh, a time, a uh, watershed moment for our people and you know as uh, the issues unfolded and uh, again what has come to light in regards to the policing and, and how matters were uh, escalated because of uh, one of the biggest grievances uh, a slow response time uh, this is a case like others where you know police could have been uh, it could have been prevented had there been action uh, you know, prior to uh, the incident as escalating. Uh, we also know there's other issues there uh, regarding uh, release plans and, uh, um, uh, you know, the inab inability to support uh, a release, you know, that it took a huge amount of, uh, I think, attention. And, uh, for example, you know, addictions were an issue, mental health, was an issue and uh, also the simple fact the uh, the gentlemen were at, uh, at large, right? So yeah, yeah there's uh, a whole host of issues there, but uh, you know, uh, when we look at community safety within our nations, it's common, uh, you know, that uh, uh, they just aren't there, police aren't there, you know, to protect and to serve on the ground in our communities and, and that's a problem. And Heather, I wanted to ask you just, I'm not sure if, if you would know this, but do you know what the, you know, the current response times are for police response in, in some of these First Nations communities in Saskatchewan? Oh my goodness, it, it really does vary. And I, I, I will say from hours to sometimes, in some cases, days. Wow, uh, really, I hey? live in a First Nations community myself, so uh, if you, uh, unless there's something, uh, an accident or a fatality that has happened, uh, or but when it comes to uh, uh, you know situations like uh, you know theft or 
um, you know, um, uh, you know, break-ins and those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's it's just not uh, a response that we get immediately. In, you know, in, in many cases, not even that day. I'm still waiting a week. Uh, there was a theft that happened in, in my own yard, uh, or even, yeah, over a week now, uh, waiting for a response and for the RCMP to come. So, like I say, and that's common. That's very common within, you know, our communities. So. Uh, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, in this case of uh, James Smith, uh, you look at, uh, you know, 40 minutes, you know, uh, uh, you know, no response on the reserve and within the First Nation, you know, uh, when, when the uh, uh, incident was taking place. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a sad situation, mind you. Uh, you know, it's. Uh, I, I think that, uh, and we're going to talk about that later on. Community-based policing. You know, uh, when we talk talk about law enforcement versus, uh, you know, protect and serve, and of course, uh, you know, prevention, which I think is key in First Nations uh, communities. Well, I just that kind of leads to my next question: is you know, would a, a First Nations-based police service right in these communities like what would that just do you think in, that would help really like to, to have them right there and to have you know these properly trained individuals as well right there in these communities absolutely i think that's uh you know we need to occupy the field better in terms of you know essential services uh having uh not only just policing but uh you know, we need our, our young folks. Uh, we need our, our young people, First Nations, Aboriginal uh, people uh, being recruited. Uh, you know, when we look at, uh, you know, how, uh, you know, we can build trust and, and really get the authentic uh, treatment or authentic services, you know, especially when, you know, you're doing wellness checks and, and those kinds of things, uh, knowing and understanding, you know, uh, you know our people is very it's vital you know in terms of uh, having good service in in any sector but especially policing uh getting to know our people and uh um who the strangers are and who you know it's uh i think that's that's really key and and uh you know we need our our officers to spend more time with the young folks within the schools prevention the gang issues the you know uh uh, drugs, alcohol, all the, you know, the number one killer of our, our, our young folks, say our young people, uh, you know, there's, there's a huge, um, you know, um, opportunity there, uh, you know, to make those positive connections and, uh, and, uh, you know, not have it so our children grow up afraid of police, you know, when all they're doing is hauling away the, the parents and, uh, you know, being part of the problem. So. Well, just just in that regard, what can be done to you know get these youth involved in, in keeping their community safe? I mean, like my dad's mm -hmm. an RCMP officer, and, and all I wanted to be when I grew up was RCMP because I saw mm -hmm. you know my dad and and what he did, and and I had that connection personally, and and I know a lot of these kids, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, kids and, and community members, they grow up sort of skeptical of police at best, mm -hmm. really, right? So what can be done to, like you said, get these youth involved and maybe mm -hmm. get the youth involved in policing some of their own communities? Well, I think some of those things have we, we've already been doing within the FSIN. I, I know the Bold Eagle program, you know, is one of the, the young steps, first steps, uh, you know, from a regional perspective, getting involved in those uh, uh, programs. Uh, are really, you know, vital and important. The other, you know, there's there's other uh, uh, programs like cadets and so forth. Uh, you know, when we start learning, uh, you know, about uh, you know protecting and you know men of honor or people of honor, men and women. Uh, you know, and I, I think uh, you know we need to, um, you know, have more opportunity, better opportunity. Uh, you know initiatives for young folks to uh, be recruited and uh, but I, I think it's going to start by first of all building trust and that relationship within the police in our community in order to uh, you know uh, uh, 
I guess, open a door for young people to even have that desire. You know, we need some good stories. You know, we need heroes in policing. And uh, the way it is, when you look at, uh, you know, First Nations, disproportionate amount of uh, uh, our people incarcerated, well, that's been the experience, you know, uh, 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 law enforcement and come and, you know, come and take mom or dad away, uh, haul them away and take them to jail. You know, those, uh, a lot of hardships around policing and, uh, um, you know, big fines are being uh, handed out and uh, even simply uh, driving, you know, lately, even to, to have a license in this, in this province, it's very, um, uh, you know, with the big fines and the cost. And of course, uh, you know, we end up criminalizing people for uh, poverty, right? So there's a whole boatload of issues here, uh, but I, I really do uh, think the time is now to, you know, start steering our young folks towards, uh, you know, a career in policing. And, but we need to change things too, in terms of policy and, uh, you know, uh, uh, when we look at uh, uh, and procedure, when you look at how we are serving, you know, when you look at MMIWG, yeah. you know, and uh, all the reports that have been done uh, in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, you know, um, there's a lot, you know, we, there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, good work there that really, uh, you know, tells the story about racism, discrimination in the police force and, uh, you know, our women and men, average First Nation men not being taken seriously when when called upon in reports. The Charlene Obashan, there's another uh, tragedy mm -hmm. that could have been prevented, you know, if, uh, if we had the same service other that others do. But yeah, I think that's uh, uh, community-based policing is essential. And I would also like to see an MMIWG unit in every major police force in, in our region as well, you know, to help serve and enhance and, and build the trust and the authenticity, you know, of uh, services there for our people. Yeah, and, and just sort of with that, the, the federal government has just announced, you know, millions for First Nations policing. Um, you know, mm -hmm. is it enough, too little, is it too late, or is it, you know, like, well, what's your thoughts on this funding? Well, I think it's never too late uh, when we look at, uh, you know, the hope and moving forward. Uh, you know, the, like I say, you know, we look at the Charlene Obashan situation. You look at James Smith, Smith and the tragedies there. That many, many more, too many to count. Yeah. Uh, you know, we need to come to a point of change. And I think, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, you know, a transition, you know, for self-administered uh, policing, you know, uh, a transitional period could take probably at least two years. So in the meantime, what do we do right now? Well, you know, there is some capacity, you know, through COVID, we've had peacekeepers occupying the field uh, within our um, uh, communities. And, uh, you know, they've been very helpful in terms of uh, helping people to feel safe and protected. Uh, not only from COVID, but other other uh, negative elements that come into our communities. Uh, um, there has been, uh, you know, a lot of data in terms of, you know, drug selling and, you know, uh, people being more aware of where this activity is. So I, I think there's been a lot of capacity. And given, you know, the, the, the magnitude of James Smith, the urgency is now, what about right now today i think there's some good examples out there like uh, uh file hills uh, uh has their own uh, partnership uh on the on the reserve in uh, uh file hills Coppel, a police detachment which is funded uh mind you they they do have funding challenges there it is it is uh uh really isn't enough i think they're working on some infrastructure which i'm happy to hear uh that's needed uh, there's other communities like just last week for example buffalo river you know they there's some infrastructure issues there in terms of having uh you know a holding holding um, unit there uh they have to take uh, offenders out um, it may be two or three hours before they can have somebody back in the community so there's a whole boatload of issues we have satellite policing that's another option but 
Uh, I think right now it really should be up to the community, the First Nations. We have hot spots. We have, you know, some uh, communities that aren't as in, in need as others. And I think more training for peacekeepers. Um, some might want to look in that direction, but. Really, we really do need the training. We do need our people to start to begin um, b uh, to be empowered to, uh, you know, start protecting ourselves and, uh, you know, being, you know, occupying that field that, you know, uh, we've been um, historically, um, we've, <laughs> we've always been on the end, other end. I'll, I'll just yeah. say, you know, when you look at the history of policing and um, uh, yeah, just check it out, John, uh, Johnny McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> well, so given everything you've just mentioned, I'll leave it, I guess, with this question mm -hmm. is, what needs to happen sort of right now in the, in the short term and long term to make, you know, First Nations policing and Indigenous policing a reality in, in these communities? Well, I think we need to uh, uh, make a, a strong effort uh, in terms of mobilization, community mobilization, pr uh, crime prevention, and start, uh, 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 you know, looking into that area a little more. And it's something that we are lacking, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, plans. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of First Nations that live together uh, or side by side. And I think uh, looking at some feasibility studies, um, I know uh, uh, PAGC, Prince Albert Grand Council is doing a lot of good work there too, and I think they're ready. But like for right now, uh, you know, I think it's up to the community and I think, uh, you know, they're looking at training. Uh, some are looking at outside security to come in, uh, contracting that, but whatever it takes, we have to do something, you know. Uh, our people are important and uh, you know I think we really need to take a, a serious look at you know uh, um, our relationships uh, with police and police communities and police and um, start really making an honest effort to uh, you know work together and um, uh, respect some of the laws and the jurisdictions you know chief and council when we look at band council resolutions and, you know, helping to enforce some of the bylaws, you know, that they feel are important. I think that's a good start. Well, that's certainly well said, Heather. We're going to have to leave it right there, but uh, thank mm -hmm. you so much for taking a few minutes out of your day. We certainly appreciate your insight and, and your thoughts regarding all of this. So again, thank you for taking some time for us. I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good day. All right, it's time for a short break, but stay with us. We will hear from the First Nation Chiefs of Police after the break. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Many advocates say that the way to redefine the relationship between Indigenous people and police is to have First Nations-led solutions. The federal government recently announced funding to establish and further the goal of First Nations police forces in Canada. And in Alberta, Indigenous policing is recognized under the Provincial Police Act. That means those services have more freedom when it comes to decision making. Here's a report from Tamara Pimentel on the Blood Tribe Police Service in Treaty 7 territory. Here on the Blood Tribe, the community's police service has its own dispatch and communication center, a cell block and 37 police officers. Well, for the past 30 years, we've been receiving the same training as our policing partners. We follow the same standards, we're subject to the same rules, the same hiring practices, and yet we're significantly underfunded compared to our policing partners. There are three Indigenous police services in Alberta. The Alberta government announced it will recognize those forces in the Provincial Police Act. This gives Indigenous policing more power to make decisions, hire and appoint their own officers, 
issue tickets and enforce community bylaws without approval by the province. I mean, it's great to get this recognition. It's great that we're going to be able to govern ourselves. But what we're missing here is, is the, the funding that goes along with it. Even with this announcement, Indigenous policing in Alberta is still seen as a program. We need to be moved from, from a program to essential service. With over 1,400 square kilometres to cover, to its community, the Blood Tribe Police Service is essential. Indigenous people deserve uh, quality public safety. And when, when they're underfunding Indigenous police services, they're basically saying that public safety in an Indigenous community with their own police service isn't as important. Leonard Bush is the executive director of the First Nations Chiefs of Police Association. The organization represents 36 Indigenous police forces, including the Blood Tribe. An important part of their mandate is reflecting cultural, social and constitutional diversity. Leonard joins me now. Leonard, thank you so much for being here on APTN In Focus. Oh, thank you for having me on. So I guess to start off, can you just tell us a little bit about uh, your organization? Uh, we're the First Nations Chiefs Police Association. Uh, we were formed in uh, 1993, shortly after uh, uh, the government started the First Nations Policing Program. And we represent, uh, you know, the 30, right now, currently the 36 First Nations uh, Police Services across Canada. And uh, by, you know, facilitating the highest level of professionalism and, and accountability, and uh, in a way that reflects, you know, the unique cultures, you know, the constitutional status, social circumstances, traditions, and the, uh, the aspirations of First Nations communities across Canada. So what are some of the specific things that your organization does for the for these First Nations uh, police services? Well, we uh, uh, provide a lot of uh, education in terms of uh, police leadership. Uh, we do a lot of liaison with the government agencies. Uh, we uh, solicit uh, you know, uh, through... Uh, face-to-face -face con face -face contact and, and surveys and things like that, the opinions and the concerns of, of the First Nations Police Services so we can speak as that one voice when we're talking to uh, the different uh, or various gov government uh, agencies and levels. And Leonard, what is the value of having um, self, self-administered, um, you know, Indigenous policing? Like, wh wh how important is that? Well, I think it's very important because it supports the uh, distinct approaches to uh, First Nations policing that reflect Aboriginal culture and contributes to, uh, you know, the culture, integrity, and the safety of First Nations communities in Canada. It, uh, you know, we feel it's a, it's a policing model that, you know, speaks to self-determination, uh, but also a uh, real uh, true level of community policing where we have people, you know, of the same cultural background and sometimes from the same communities that, that are being served by the, by the police services. So when you look at high profile, uh, you know, crimes like the James Smith First Nations, for example, pretty recently here, um, those stabbings, how do you see First Nations policing offering solutions in those types of situations? Well, we can't change the past, but, uh, you know, with our, our past or our collective mistakes, uh, but we better learn from them. And I think, uh, uh, First Nations police services uh, are, are, are well placed to work with the communities in addressing some of the those, some of those social issues and, and the symptoms that we're seeing from those uh, often historical social issues, uh, and, and are best placed uh, by their just by their presence in the community to work with the community uh, uh, resources and uh, and uh, and have a more pro proactive approach to to. Uh, to working, uh, you know, uh, uh, with the resources that are available in addressing those issues. And you had mentioned that um, part of your part of the work that your organization does is working with RCMP. Um, so, how do you see other First Nations police services, you know, working with RCMP and, and coinciding together to, you know, to provide safety and, and work together? Well, interagency uh, cooperation is crucial with addressing, uh, you know, the complexities of crime in Canada. Uh, uh, crime is uh, these days is very uh, mobile. It's very technologically advanced. Uh, no one police service by themselves can address all the issues because you know the issues of gangs and drugs and, and guns and, and human trafficking 
those are national issues and even international issues that cannot can't be addressed completely at the local level so you have to work in in uh cooperation with other agencies uh to, to address those things and there's a historic mistrust between indigenous peoples and you know rcmp and other police forces um so how did how does first nations police services you know try to bridge that gap of sorts well i think just uh, by the presence in the community uh, having a, a a good solid relationship let the community get to know who you are hopefully the community starts to see them as their police service as opposed to a police service that comes in from somewhere else and, and delivers that service. I think it's, it's really true community policing where people get to know the members that are working in their communities a lot better. The members of the communities tend to uh, be around a lot longer than some of the larger police services where people transfer in, transfer out. So it's, it's all about building and, and sustaining good good relationships with, uh, with the community and the, the different uh, agencies and governance uh, structures within that community. And there's also more and more First Nations wanting their own police force and, and you know, because of the mistrust with RCMP. Uh, so what does that say about, you know, how important it is to, to have uh, a First Nations police force in First Nations? I mean, like I said, more and more, you know, communities are wanting this and, and they're wanting to get their own, you know, force. Yeah, well, I think, I just uh, think people... Uh, uh, just aren't feeling safe within their communities and a lot of communities are in crisis right now and they they want to have a more of a presence on the ground in their community and have police officers that they they can relate to uh better and, and uh and and have police officers that understand that things that are happening in the community that's not always possible with a larger regional policing model where uh communities don't always have that on the ground presence the uh uh, you know, often, like I said, you know, with the, with the larger police models, it's more regionalized where people patrol into communities as opposed to living there and working there all the time. So I think they just want that that uh, that police presence. And also, they want accountability. They want a uh, police service that answers to the community through through the you know a police board or, or through the chief and council. And uh, it is a very positive thing when that happens uh, because if there is a, a problem or, or a complaint. Often it could be dressed almost immediately, sometimes within hours. Whereas with uh, larger models, you know, you have a whole bureaucracy that, you know, uh, that looks after public complaints and stuff like that. And, and it can uh, take a long time before anybody gets any kind of a result or, or the need to change is made. Now, the uh, federal government just announced some funding for First Nations policing. Um, is, is it enough? Is it too little? Is it too late for some of this funding? What, what, what's your take on that? Well, a lot of the funding, I think, just brings First Nations uh, police services up to the level that it should have been funded earlier on. Uh, it's been an ongoing uh, issue uh, with the First Nations police services that, first of all, the funding wasn't sufficient. Uh, they were working on short-term uh, contribution agreements. It was very hard to do any kind of long-term or meaningful strategic planning when you're working from year to year or a two or three or even just a five-year contribution agreement. It impacted things like uh, recruiting and retention of employees where you couldn't, as a chief of police, you couldn't definitively tell somebody that, yes, you're going to come and work for us and you're going to have a full uh, full career, uh, whereas because we're always just waiting for the next agreement to be signed and negotiated. So uh, the money that's coming now, while it's positive and it's starting to get some of our staffing levels up to, to where they should be to provide the good service, uh, there's a lot more that's going to be needed in terms of uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, stabilizing the police force that we have and also addressing the calls for uh, for more self-administered uh, First Nations police services. And right on that note there, that was right into my next question, is uh, you said your organization represents uh, just over 30 um, First Nations police services. So is there maybe talks of, of gaining more and, and getting more into your organization, especially with, with this recent funding? Well, there are ongoing talks uh, through... Uh, uh, with uh, Public Safety Canada and with the provinces and territories about, uh, uh, well, it stems from the uh, proposed essential service legislation that we're working on right now. The, the FNCP has been working closely with uh, those entities in in, uh, in uh, moving in a direction where, where uh, First Nation police officers are going to be uh, enshrined in legislation as essential service as an ongoing part of Canada's policing makeup. Uh, whereas before they were just uh, thought of as kind of a supplement to existing police services or, or an enhancement. I think that's where, you know, the, why, where the calls for uh, First Nations police services to be considered essential services are coming from. 
So it's uh, it, it's 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 been a long time coming. Like I, you know, I think there was a lot of good intentions, you know, with the First Nations policing program originally, but it just uh, didn't meet the needs uh, and aspirations of First Nations communities uh, in a way uh, that was satisfactory. And I think with some of the some of the sadder and tragic things that have happened across the country in recent years, it's really inflamed the, the, the calls for a different approach of policing in uh, a lot of First Nations communities. And uh, Leonard, is policing uh, attractive to a, to a young First Nations person, do you think? Like, in your experience, is, is there, you know, interest in communities from young people? Well, there's some interest in, in the communities from young people, but it's not as much as we would like to see. Uh, I know there's a lot of good people, a lot of good prospects. When I was the chief of police, we're always looking uh, to identify and, and to uh, recruit, uh, you know, First Nations people from our community. And uh, but a lot of times they just say, well, thank you very much, you know, for thinking about me, but I don't think it's for me. So I think we have to do a better job in, in uh, changing the image of policing, uh, particularly with our young people, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, tell our stories better. I think uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, people are exposed to all the negative things that happen in policing, you know, the George Floyd type things. Whereas, uh, but we don't tell our story in terms of the, the good and heroic things that our police officers do. I don't think we we talk enough about how, you know, uh, continuing that warrior's tradition and protecting our communities uh, and what that means uh, to a First Nations person. And I think, you know, the steps that we have to take to, to turn things around uh, with young people and work with them and, uh, you know, hopefully really get them thinking hard, you know, about a career in policing. And I can say after 43 years in policing, it was quite an adventure. It was an excellent thing. And if I could do it all over again, I would. But uh, I'm too old right now. <laughs> well, I, it's, I think you could still uh, be doing a great job at it. And, and in your current role, you're doing a great job. But um, on that note, so you just mentioned some of the things of, of teaching or, you know, expressing to the young kids what you guys do what else might compel them to become a first nations police officer i mean my dad's a rcmp member and and you know that's all i wanted to be growing up was you know i wanted to be like my dad and and be a police officer so you know what are some of the other types of things that um you know you guys could do to to try and get these uh young people into policing well i think like i said we have to tell our stories but i think we have to exploit uh, social media better to get the message to young people I think we have to, uh, you know, really encourage our police officers. I think our, our police officers on the ground are our number one recruiting tool, like in any police service, to get them out there and, and to uh, engage young people, you know, uh, and, and just to you know, help educate them as to exactly what, uh, you know, the policing career is all about. The young people, if they're not sure, they don't know, and, and they, they don't know who to ask, that's a, a, that's a significant barrier to, uh, to attracting somebody into the career. And Leonard, I, I don't really have that many more questions for you, but I guess I wanted to, one of the ones I wanted to ask before you left is, where do you see First Nations policing going in the future um, as opposed to, you know, where it's come from? Well, I think it's, uh, again, it's a, an evolving thing. Uh, we started off with the First Nations policing uh, program, which uh, at the time might have served the purpose, but it certainly uh, has lagged behind uh, you know, the needs, wants, and expectation of our First Nations community. Uh, also, for the police service involved, uh, they've expanded, they've, they've uh, uh, professionalized uh, and gained a lot of skills and expertise where they're addressing uh, crime problems and issues that were maybe wasn't the intention at the, at the outset of that program. So, time has changed, things have evolved. Our police services are seen, our police officers are seen as leaders in the community, and they're often asked to address things that perhaps, uh, you know, uh, uh, a mainstream police service or a larger police service wouldn't be called to because just because of the lack of social uh, uh, support within the community long time people if they see the police officer uh, you know as a leader and someone who's willing to work with the community things that may not even be typically thought of as, as policing uh, you know if that's happening and it is happening then our police officers have to be trained a little differently you know they have to have uh, you know a different approach to the way they deliver that police service and, and uh, be open and willing you know, to work with uh, the different resources in the community to address those uh, those uh, issues, you know, the, the safety issues, the social issues, the historical issues, and all those things. Uh, a lot of things that we see on a day-to-day -day basis is, is the symptoms of bigger and often often historic uh, issues. You know, the 
the human trafficking, the drugs, the gangs, all those things are rooted in, in, in uh, you know, uh, social problems. And as we've gotten to a lot of communities, as, as we all know, have gotten to crisis situations right now that, that have to be addressed better. But it's not going to happen overnight. But uh, uh, we got to, you know, we got to be doing something. We get, and we know police can't do it without, without uh, you know, engaging and working with the communities. That is certainly well said, Leonard, and uh, that is uh, all the time we have right now for this, but we certainly appreciate all of your insights and uh, your expertise on this topic, and uh, we'll have to leave it there. But again, thank you, Miigwech, for all your time here on uh, In Focus. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. All right, it's time for one final break, but stay with us. We will have more on Indigenous policing ahead. Welcome back to APTN In Focus. Let's go to social media now with our social media editor, Jesse Andrushko, to hear what some of you are saying about today's topic. Thanks, Daryl. Online, we asked our followers whether they think a First Nations police service would help to combat crimes in communities. We got a lot of great answers and a few other suggestions on how to prevent crime. Let's take a look. First from Dennis, he says, I'm not sure if that would help. The justice system has to change too. For instance, a well-known criminal should be looked at very seriously before being released. Glenn says, having a First Nation police service of their own people gives them the advantage of knowing the community and its people. Policing from an outside force may not draw them to the problems within the community. The trust level is higher when both sides have a knowledge of each other. From Jaden, I think mental health support is more important if people are becoming radicalized. Vaughn says, policing only treats the symptom of the socioeconomic problems. From Edith, get drug sniffing dogs, search and seize, a healing lodge for families. Marlin says, why are we always reactive instead of being proactive? The kids need to trust again and we need to learn how to parent. We need, we need Indigenous people to work with Indigenous people. We can overcome our trauma, but not while we have non-Indigenous people calling the shots. Lastly, from Rhodes, education goes a long way towards preventing crime, as does economic participation and the means to do so. Thank you to everyone that shared their thoughts. If you'd like to add your opinion about First Nations Police, here's how. Join our conversation now. Like us on Facebook on our APTN News page. Follow or tweet us at APTN In Focus. And send your thoughts to infocus at aptn.ca. All right, thanks so much for that, Jesse. While leaders are asking for Indigenous-led police forces in some provinces, in Ontario, the Anishinaabe Aski Police Service serves 34 nations on Anishinaabe Aski territory. Here is a Chief of Police Roland Morrison and Board Chair Mike Meditawaban as they spoke with Dennis Ward. Gentlemen, uh, thanks so much for being with us here on the show. Uh, Mike, maybe let's start with you. Uh, a little history on how the Anishinaabe Aski Police Force, uh, Police Service was formed. Well, yeah, just, I don't know how far back, but uh, prior to the Anishinaabe Aski Police Services, um, before 1994, uh, the policing services was provided by the, by the province along with the uh, special constable program and uh we had special constables who were working with the uh the province the provincial police service uh ontario provincial police and in 1994 is when the uh the Asky police service came into being and uh since then we've been uh, steadily uh evolving it's been a uh it's been a, a learning process also at the same time a very challenging process in terms of the involvement of the police service for, for our region. Uh, Mike, uh, be asking you to dig back in your mind a little here, but was there something in 1994 that led to the establishment of uh, NAPS? I think it was the uh, it was the goal of the for the region, for the communities that uh, we service. It was always a need to have our own uh, police service and uh, that's when uh, work began to incorporate a police service uh, under the heading of what we have now. 
under the umbrella of uh, Anishinaabe SC Nation. Police Chief Morrison, uh, long response times have been a, a common issue for Indigenous communities. Has NAPS been able to help out with that? Yes and no. Um, when you look at the makeup of each Indigenous police service, uh, we are underfunded. Therefore, we don't have the resources for frontline res response on a 24-7 basis. So it does take time for Indigenous services to have a response to any incidences that occur uh, in many of our communities. And we are have to rely on the you know, other police services, uh, such as the Ontario Provincial Police, which in many cases uh, are our, our policing partner and respond to many critical incidences when there is shortage in personnel. Indigenous peoples have long uh, had issues with police, especially around uh, allegations of racism, violence. Uh, how does SNAPS work within the system to try and address that? Well, certainly it is very challenging in today's environment. Uh, you know, with all the social media that has captured, you know, uh, doc and documented, you know, police officers' interaction with the public. And certainly it's, uh, it's necessary for the police service to work with our policing partners to ensure that we're providing that educational awareness about Indigenous culture, you know, ensure that we're able to work with them and maybe establish partnerships and uh, memorandums of understanding as to how we can better work together and to improve service delivery so that we're able to work with not just the Indigenous culture, but all aspects of, uh, of, of, of uh, different cultures that are making up our society today. So again, it's uh, as a police service, at an Indigenous police service, it's a responsibility of us to make sure that we're educating and forming partnerships with police services that, you know, that want to do that outreach to Indigenous people, but also again, you know, making sure that it's not just Indigenous people, but other cultures as well. Uh, Mike, do you think the uh, NAPS has, uh, you know, there been a different relationship with police since uh, NAPS has come into effect? For the communities? Yeah. Yes and no, again. Like, it's been, uh, the goal was to have our own, our own people uh, fill in the, the roles, uh, be the, uh, the main face to the uh, police service. Uh, however, that's been challenging uh, right from the beginning because of the uh, the way the uh, organization was established and set up. Uh, like uh, Chief Morrison said, we did not have the uh, resources. We, we were not funded accordingly. So it was very difficult, very challenging uh, in the beginning. And like I said earlier, we've come a long ways. Uh, we've evolved and we've... Uh, overcome those challenges and that's where we're currently hoping to to head into is to uh to promote the police service now that it's uh fully well not entirely fully but uh getting to that point of being a fully funded uh, police service yeah i'd like to get both of you on this one with the federal government announcing more money for indigenous policing uh, mike is is that enough well, I just want to point out first that uh, for Nishinaabeyaski Police Services, uh, we entered into these uh, discussions uh, way back, starting back in 2013 with the province uh, to uh, seek legislation under the, uh, with the province. And uh, that, uh, those negotiations have, uh, have progressed uh, positively. Uh, we've We've done a lot of legwork, done a lot of work. Uh, we're at that point where um, we're just waiting for the province to to make the proclamation to uh, to have uh, Nishinaabeyaski Police Services uh, fully uh, operating under the legislation. But they do have some uh, pro um, processes that they need to uh, finish. So I think that's what, where we are in terms of waiting. Chief Morrison, are there uh items that you can point to uh, when it comes to policing where you know funding is definitely a, a glaring uh, thing that you need i think when you're if you were to ask uh, each indigenous uh, police chief across this across canada uh, i'm sure all of them will tell you that more funding is needed when you look at uh, core functions of police service um, such as uh, 
one of the core functions in the province of Ontario is for being able to provide emergency response. Um, that funding isn't available through the First Nation Inuit policing program. When you look at uh, having crime units to investigate major crime or even drugs and drugs are plaguing our communities, um, we are not funded for specialized services. And again, when you look at uh, a core function of a police service, you have to have the ability to provide those services. And right now with, with the way the First Nation Inuit Policing Program is set up, those service delivery requirements for, for our police service especially Indigenous policing, we're not funded for it. So again, more funding is needed. So uh, when you look at some of the smaller services, uh, you know, they're basically funded for frontline delivery only. So specialized services such as emergency response, crime units, drug investigators, canine services, those are services that, uh, that were, Indigenous services are not funded for here in Canada. How much would those uh, things that you just named off, um, you know, how, how important, how often are those the, the calls that you'd be getting? You know, when you look at uh, the violent crime and the crime severity index uh, in Canada here, you will find a lot of Indigenous communities um, and, and police service that are providing you know, a service to those communities. We're very high on the violent crime and the crime severity index. Uh, with many of the services ranking at the top of those indexes. So when you think about the environment that Indigenous police officers are working in, it is a very uh, trauma-filled environment because of you know uh, the colonialism, the residential school impacts. So again, uh, this has an impact on a service and especially on the mental health of officers who are working within this environment. So again, it's, uh, it's very challenging. It is, it is a very challenging environment right now. Chief Morrison, does, does jurisdiction between police services play into uh, any of those challenges? Yes, it does. Uh, so when you look at, uh, um, especially w with major crimes, you know, so such as, uh, say, uh, um, homicide investigation, here in the province of Ontario, all the Indigenous services, we work with the Ontario Provincial Police, they come in and, and investigate these major crimes. Um, again, that's the way the system is set up. We don't have the capacity or the resources to investigate these major crimes. And when you look at the larging policing partners, such as the OPP and uh, in other parts of Canada, the RCMP, you know, so those larger services um, provide that specialized support. Chief Morrison, if you had all the money in the world at your hands, your fingertips, so what would be some of the things that you'd move to improve right away with NAPS? You know, definitely, I think uh, not only with our service, but all the other Indigenous services, more resources, more frontline officers. Mm -hmm. You know, we need more boots on the ground. We need uh, additional uh, victim support units because there is a lot of victims that our services are dealing with. And when you think about the domestic violence, sexual abuse, you know, it is happening. Uh, you know, you, hate to, you don't want to talk about it, but it is happening. It's happening at an alarming rate. And uh, you know, having more resources dedicated to that for investigations, for victim support, um, even just having housing units in our communities uh, that a police services can have as a safe place while you're making um, arrangements to get that victim support. You know, you're looking at training units, you're looking at emergency response, you're looking at specialized investigation units, you're looking at traffic support. You know, there's a wide area that each services needs to address and with the way the funding is set up right now, it is very difficult to advance a services initiatives forward or even provide service delivery when the funding isn't appropriate for what the service or the community needs. So again, there's, uh, there's a lot of improvement that needs to get done for the First Nation Inuit Policing Program. Indeed. Uh, Mike, uh, you know, no doubt that uh, many other nations are, are looking to have their own police force. Uh, what advice would you give to those nations, those leaders uh, looking to set up their own police service? Well, just uh, thinking back, um, you need the community needs to, to be supportive, to be engaged, to be part of the uh, process in terms of setting up a police service. Uh, I think creating awareness to our young people, to our young crowd, to, our, uh, to make it uh, understandable that uh, policing can be a career now. It is a career and it's uh, anybody who uh, joins the police service can go, uh, can go anywhere in, in Canada to uh, 
officer. So those are things I would uh, I would throw out there as part of uh, as as advice to people willing to enter into this. Uh, Mike, Chief Morrison, we'll have to leave it there, but uh, appreciate you taking your time to join us on the show this week. Thank you very much. All right, that's all we have for you this week on EPTN in Focus. A big thank you to everyone who joined our show today and shared their thoughts, their insights, and, and some of their opinions on Indigenous policing. This episode will be available for download as a podcast on our website at aptnnews.ca backslash podcast. And if you missed any of the shows and you want to catch up, you can check out the website, aptnnews.ca. Thank you for joining us, Amikwich, and have a great day. Thank you.